Let me introduce myself and tell you about the dynamics of my marriage. I am Shane, a 45-year-old man, and my wife Carrie, who is 44 years old. We have been married for 23 years now. Our family constellation has been further enriched by our daughter Casey, who is currently in her final semester of college. Casey has always been a source of great joy and satisfaction in our lives. As she nears the end of her education, she aspires to become a dedicated math teacher. My childhood was spent in a quaint Texas town located on a ranch. Despite the demands of life on the ranch, I managed to find time for sports, rodeo competitions, and delightful communication with the opposite sex. After graduating from high school, I continued my college studies, immersing myself in the study of agriculture. It was at this time that I realized my passion for teaching, especially in the field of AG education in high school. Realizing the limited financial resources of my parents, I took it upon myself to work part-time, filling the gap and complementing their contributions. As my last semester of college approached, my parents, tired of years of hard work, made a fateful decision. After selling the ranch, they decided to move to a modest house in the city. The sale of the ranch brought them a significant amount, which they intended to use as retirement income. Tragically, when we were returning from my graduation, they were both swept away by a terrible car accident. The accident was caused by an impact, causing their car to flip over. As their only child, I inherited the money from the sale of their small ranch, an unexpected sum of about $400,000. To my surprise, they had never revealed this information to me before. The following months proved incredibly difficult for me, as I overcame waves of grief and loss. Losing both parents at the same time was an incredibly difficult ordeal, as the longing for their presence weighed heavily on me. But I managed to overcome the depths of grief, and gradually resumed my life path. Unexpectedly, in August, I was offered a job transferring knowledge in agricultural sciences at a high school located outside Austin. Driven by a passion for teaching, I gladly jumped at this golden opportunity with open arms. In addition, I decided to use my inheritance by buying a fancy 25-acre ranch located nearby. Having transformed the land, I carefully built a modern log cabin, a barn for horses and started a small farm, thereby creating a serene shelter for myself. I decided to invest in a training ring for the horses I was planning to purchase. In addition, I took up cattle breeding. Although I did not admit that I was looking for a life partner, I secretly wanted to find a girl with whom I could fall in love and share my prosperous life with her. Having children was also an important ambition of mine. About a month after the start of the school year, fate brought me together with Carrie. My mentor teacher sensed the potential chemistry between us and arranged a date. I was hesitant at first, but decided it was worth a try. After all, I haven't been out on a date for a long time because of the circumstances around me. As soon as she opened the door, I was speechless. Her beauty was breathtaking. At that moment, I realized that I had stumbled upon someone special. We decided to have dinner together and then have a drink at a local bar. Throughout the evening, we had delightful conversations, laughed, and enjoyed drinks. Being in Carrie's company was incredibly natural and comfortable. In the end, we returned to her apartment, sat on the balcony and deepened into conversation. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't help but wonder why such an incredible and beautiful person like her wasn't married. To my surprise, she turned the question back to me, acknowledging my own attractiveness and asking why I wasn't married either. I couldn't help but blush and admit, Carrie, that I've never met anyone I'd like to settle down with. The girls I dated in the past were too quirky or flighty to think about anything serious. But you, my dear, are a breath of fresh air. There's something about you that sets you apart from others and makes me feel like things could be different. Well, Shane, I can't disagree. Most of the guys I've come across have either been complete idiots or terrible scoundrels. It's really nice to finally meet someone like you. I've never dated a guy who made me think about a serious relationship until tonight. I turned to face her, our eyes met, 
and we bent down for a gentle and affectionate kiss. It wasn't an aggressive or dirty French kiss, but rather a soft and affectionate one. We continued to kiss for several minutes, enjoying the moment. Breaking the silence, I expressed a desire to see her again. I stressed that we didn't need to rush, but I sincerely wanted to explore where this connection might take us. I wanted to take the time to really understand and appreciate her before taking any further steps. Carrie, I have to say that you are one of the kindest people I have ever come across. You really are a gentleman. Many men would have already started making inappropriate attentions to me. I grinned and replied, I won't deny that such a thought has crossed my mind. You are incredibly attractive and alluring, but I treat you with great respect despite our recent acquaintance. I want to build a full-fledged relationship, not just a fleeting meeting. She leaned over and kissed me again. Then she whispered, I feel the same way, Shane. You are unique, and I look forward to the opportunity to establish a deeper connection with you. Carrie came from a financially disadvantaged family that couldn't pay for her college tuition. Therefore, she chose a vocational school to get an education as an administrative secretary. She has been working for a thriving small business in Austin for the past few years. Over time, our bond grew stronger and stronger, and eventually we fell deeply in love with each other. About four weeks after our first date, we shared an intimate moment. Admittedly, it was a tense encounter that took place in the front seat of my truck after watching a movie with explicit scenes. I'm grateful that we managed to get to the car. Once we were inside, our connection was instantaneous, and our actions quickly intensified, dragging on to complete satisfaction. The windows were undoubtedly fogged up, and the car rocked gently with our shared enjoyment. Carrie's abilities were extraordinary. Her passion was unparalleled and resonated loudly in a confined space. After that, we went to my house, where the rest of the night was devoted to expressing our love through intimate moments. It was an evening filled with deep passion and marked the beginning of our deep affection for each other. Over the following months, our bond grew stronger and stronger. We rarely parted as our bond grew deeper. By March, she had decided to move in with me, consolidating our commitments. A wonderful union was sealed on the 1st of June, when we exchanged vows and became husband and wife. A little over a year later, our joy multiplied with the birth of our beloved Casey. The next 23 years were simply extraordinary. We were a contented and harmonious family basking in the happiness we shared. Although we were not well off, we found solace in our modest means. Our intimate life has been a source of great pleasure for Carrie and me. The fire of passion burned brightly in her, and I too did not cease to be captivated by her charm. I must admit that over the past five or six months, the pace of our classes has noticeably decreased, but the fervor seems to have remained. Or not. Let me paint the current picture 23 years later. About six months ago, Carrie started a new job as executive secretary to Benjamin Brockman, CEO and owner of BRB Enterprises. BRB Enterprises was a thriving manufacturing company specializing in producing first-class electronics for the U.S. government. Undoubtedly, Benjamin Brockman was a wealthy man, which indicates the prosperity of his company. He completely owned the company alone. Carrie was very enthusiastic about her new job, often mentioning her boss Ben. At first I felt a pang of envy, until I finally got to know him. Ben, a 58-year-old man, showed signs of baldness and overweight. Compared to him I seemed to have an unsurpassed appearance. Curiosity made me wonder what Carrie admires so much. She just grinned, and assured me that no one would ever be able to match me. Her affectionate comments always emphasized her love for our intimate moments together. So I decided that I had no reason to worry. I didn't think much of it until she started accompanying him on business trips. Each time they left for a few days. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked what kind of trips they were. In response, she just laughed, saying that this was a normal part of her job. She assured me that she has her own hotel room, and they are dealing with work issues. 
Although a part of me was still worried, she gave me no reason to doubt her, and I decided to leave it as it was. On that momentous Friday, I returned home from school and immediately headed to the barn. About an hour later, Carrie arrived at the scene. She got out of the car and headed for the house. Catching her eye, I called out, Hey honey, I'm almost done. I'll be there soon to cook delicious steaks for our dinner. I've missed you so much. Carrie has been on a business trip for the last three days, accompanied by her boss. She glanced in my direction and only nodded before entering the house. Following her example, I went into the kitchen and took a beer out of the fridge. Turning to Carrie, I asked, Honey, would you like a beer or maybe a glass of wine? Without taking her eyes off the floor, she quietly mentioned her desire to drink a glass of wine. Not once did she look up at me. In response to her request, I quickly brought a glass of wine and put the bottle next to her. Only then did she look up and meet my gaze. There was an anxious expression on her face, as if she was carrying a heavy burden. Wanting to comfort her, I gently kissed and hugged her, and then gently asked, My love, what is bothering you? You look exhausted. Did something happen during the trip? Filling her glass with wine, she took a careful sip, not finishing it to the end. Worried, I asked her to take her time and share what was bothering her. I assured her that it couldn't be as bad as she thought. Shane, I have something heavy on my mind, and I need to say everything before I lose my temper, she admitted. After listening to her willingly, I encouraged her to tell me what was bothering her. After finishing the rest of the wine in her glass, she uttered words that stunned me. Words that I never expected to hear. That's what she said. I want to make it clear that what I'm going to say has nothing to do with the fact that you are an inferior spouse, partner, friend, or father. You are, without a doubt, the most wonderful person I have ever met. Unfortunately, our current situation is not developing for the better. Although I have not expressed my concerns, I understand that what I am about to tell you is likely to have a profound impact on my life. Shane, I've made the decision to start divorce proceedings, and I'm moving out immediately. I have to admit that your concerns about me and Ben are well-founded. Unfortunately, we've been having an affair for the last five months, and he's had strong feelings of love for me. As soon as our divorce is officially finalized, we will get married, you and I will split everything equally, but you can keep ownership of the house, the ranch, and all the property located here. I will only take my clothes and personal belongings. She paused briefly to give me a chance to think about her words. Please continue, I replied calmly, although deep down I was seething with anger and in great pain. Let's strive for a quick resolution of the problem by filing for divorce due to irreconcilable differences. With these words, she paused, as if giving me an opportunity to speak out. And I definitely had something to say. Carrie, do you have romantic feelings for Ben? I care about him, and I find him incredibly intriguing. I think my love for him will grow over time. Carrie, does Ben satisfy you more intimately than I do? In other words, is he the best lover? Are you not satisfied with my ability to please you? There's no need to feel ashamed. He can't even compare to you. You are an extraordinary lover. I've always been completely satisfied with you. I asked, Have I treated you badly? Are you not satisfied with our relationship? I am sincerely trying to understand your actions, why you are destroying our marriage and family. I feel incredibly confused, Carrie. Shane, whenever I show kindness to Ben, he showers me with extravagant gifts. He loves me deeply and is happy to express his gratitude. He even said that if I agreed to marry him, then life would be easy. I won't have to work, and I'll be able to have everything I want, a luxury car, the opportunity to travel the world. You want to wear the most exquisite outfits and visit elite restaurants. Thus, the essence of the issue revolves around wealth. You are striving to raise the status of your partner to a person with significant financial wealth. But let me enlighten you, Carrie. Is there a term that accurately describes your actions? Shane, I have to make it clear that I do not engage in intimacy for money, she said with tears in her eyes. I sincerely apologize for hurting you, but this is a decision I have to make. 
I can't turn down the opportunity to become the wife of a rich man. Carrie, your actions are causing me mental anguish. Can you understand the depth of my pain? For 23 long years, I have put all my strength and dedication into giving you everything that is possible. And it's not just about material goods, but also about those intangible things that really matter. I gave you my unwavering love, affection, friendship. I bared my heart and soul, giving you everything in my power. Unfortunately, my inability to accumulate great wealth has left you unsatisfied, and for that I sincerely apologize. Now I feel the need to retire and find solace in the barn while you start packing. It was obvious that she had been plagued by remorse throughout this ordeal. She didn't seem to notice the extent of the torment she was causing, absorbed only in her newfound wealth. In search of solace, I took refuge in the barn, lying down on a bale of hay. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed by a wave of overwhelming emotions, and tears flowed down my face. It is worth noting that I am not one of those who shed tears easily, because my father instilled in me the belief that men should never cry. Even at the funeral of my own parents, I remained dry-eyed. At that moment, I felt indescribable pain and thought about my own guilt. Could I have done something differently? Was it my fault? After crying, I realized that this was the last time I would cry for Carrie. Carrie entered the barn and took a quick glance in my direction before saying the words, Oh my God, what have I done? Her voice trembled with regret as she continued, Shane, don't you ever cry? Have I offended you that much? I'm really sorry, Shane. I never wanted to hurt you. I took a moment to collect my thoughts before answering, and there was a mixture of disbelief and disappointment in my voice. Well, Carrie, let's figure out the situation, okay? You came home all of a sudden and told me that you wanted to end our marriage, destroy our family, move out and file for divorce. And now I find out that you've been having an affair with another man for the last five months. My tone turned even colder when I added, and apparently it's all because I didn't meet your financial expectations. It seems that love doesn't matter to you anymore, even though you claim that you still love me. Shane, I have to tell you that I'm leaving. Ben and I are planning to fly to Paris tomorrow morning, where we will stay for a few days. As soon as I return, I intend to immediately begin the divorce process so that we can complete it as quickly as possible. It looks like you're eager to get rid of the 23 years we've spent together. Have you thought about how this will affect Casey? I'll talk to her tonight, and I think she'll understand the situation. Ben promised to buy her a new Mercedes and pay off her college loans. He even mentioned that he would repay the loans she took out. But Carrie doesn't need me to handle the loan repayments on my own. Besides, I doubt Casey can be bribed the way you are. Carrie, I urge you to leave, and I warn you that as soon as you walk out the door, there will be no chance of reconciliation. Don't forget to give your generous benefactor a pleasant, intimate experience this evening. Perhaps he will reward you with shopping in Paris. I watched her reaction, and it seemed that she was thinking about my words. For a short time, it occurred to me that she might change her mind, but she said goodbye to me expressing her love and saying that she would miss me. With a heavy heart, I whispered, I love you too, Carrie. When she left the room, tears started flowing down my face again. Eventually, I regained my composure and reminded myself, Okay, Shane, it's time to move on. Looking at my two horses, I couldn't help but notice, Well, my dear ladies, it looks like you are the only women left here. I believe in your unwavering loyalty. Walking up to them, I gently ran my hand through their manes. They both shook their heads in agreement and gave me a little push. Heading to my empty house, I got another beer. About an hour had passed when Casey's phone rang. Dad, are you okay? I just talked to my mom. Is she completely crazy? What is she even thinking about? I commented that she had found a sugar daddy, believing that his wealth would bring her happiness. It seemed like I couldn't provide her with everything she wanted in life. This is a ridiculous idea, Dad. 
She believes that an older man and his money will completely satisfy her life. She tried to convince me that he would make a great stepfather, promised to buy me a new car and pay off my student loans. In response, I told her to keep the car and ignore his intentions. I couldn't help but laugh. Fortunately, my daughter saw in this situation what she really was. I reassured her that I would be fine and not to worry. We had a long conversation, during which she managed to cheer me up. She insisted that I promise to contact her whenever I need to talk to someone. She expressed her unwavering support for me and stressed that she would never get involved in a sugar daddy situation. The evening went on, and after a few glasses of beer, I dozed off on the couch. But my sleep was far from calm, as I repeatedly woke up from disturbing nightmares. In one of these disturbing dreams, I found myself at the mall, entered the women's fitting room, and witnessed Carrie having an intimate act with Ben. To my surprise, she looked up and laughed. The next day I got a call from my former college roommate. Hi Shane! Jerry greeted me. Over the years we have managed to keep in touch. Jerry now works in the FBI's fraud department and was even best man at our wedding. He is undoubtedly my closest friend. Several months have passed since our last conversation. Hi Jerry, how are you? I asked. He replied, I'm fine, what about you Shane? Unfortunately my response was not so positive. Carrie walked out of my life yesterday and expressed a desire to get a divorce. That's why I'm talking to you Shane. I am currently in the city and need to meet with you immediately. If it's convenient, I can arrive immediately. Jerry, what is the reason for this urgency? How could you find out about Carrie's departure? Well, to clarify, I may not have been aware of this particular event, but I have some information that I think you will be very interested in. Okay, see you soon. The thought that Jerry might know about the situation bothered me. This whole situation was getting pretty weird. When Jerry arrived about 30 minutes later, revenge had not yet taken over my thoughts, but a premonition suggested that it was already on the verge. I hospitably offered Jerry a cup of coffee, and we settled down on my back terrace, welcoming a pleasant morning. Jerry admired the tranquility and beauty around us, expressing his sympathy that my marriage had ended sadly. When I continued to explain the situation to him, his surprise became obvious. I was disappointed to find out that Jerry seemed to have been aware of Carrie and Ben in advance. I need to share something with you, but please keep it a top secret. Although I shouldn't disclose this information, I consider it important as your friend. Let's make a deal that no one else should know about our conversation. What I'm going to tell you goes beyond a simple marital question. Moreover, this is related to my official duties. Since I am involved in the operation to investigate the activities of Benjamin Brockman in connection with possible fraud in the conclusion of government contracts. We have serious suspicions that he defrauded the US government of millions of dollars. If this is confirmed, serious consequences await him. Our undercover operation has been diligently collecting evidence against him for several months now. A few more months and we will have enough evidence to ensure its complete collapse. Jerry, this is truly wonderful news. I despise this man, and watching his complete destruction will give me great pleasure. It will also serve as a fair outcome for Carrie. How could she make such a stupid decision? Leaving you for this despicable man was undoubtedly a mistake on her part. Since Carrie works as his executive secretary, she has drawn attention to this investigation. I am worried about whether Carrie is involved in these fraudulent activities. However, we have not found any evidence indicating that she was aware of these criminal activities. And yet, when the truth is revealed, she will inevitably be dragged into the situation. This will be a difficult awakening for her, because she believes that she is entering into a successful marriage and will be happy for the rest of her life. I waited patiently until I had collected all the evidence before I told you, Shane. It seems that her unquenchable thirst for wealth drove her to the actions she committed against you. Jerry opened his briefcase and took out an impressive envelope. Casually tossing it to me, he said, There is a lot of evidence of their affair here, 
if you want to use it during the divorce process, but keep in mind that you didn't get it from me. Intrigued, I carefully opened the envelope and discovered a collection of medium-sized photographs, emails and lots of explicit videos. Each of them depicted intimate encounters between them. Each item was marked with dates and times, which was visually overwhelming and caused tears. Despite my emotions, I managed to keep my composure and express gratitude to Jerry for his efforts. But I couldn't help but notice something special. In all the close-ups of her face during their meetings, she looked completely uninterested as if she was pretending. I knew how she expressed pleasure, and what I saw did not match her reaction during our intimacy. Another funny observation was that Ben really had a lot of dignity. Jerry mentioned that he needed to get back to work. He said he would stay in town for a few more days, but he had an important meeting with Brockman soon. Jerry, how about we have dinner tomorrow night? This is my way of thanking you for your help in this chaotic situation. That sounds fantastic, Shane. By the way, my sister Ashley is coming tomorrow. Is it okay if she joins us? You mean little Ashley? Of course, everything will be fine. I haven't seen her since I was 13. And now she is 36. And I must say, she has turned into an amazing woman. The irony of fate is that her divorce was finalized only today. Apparently, she unexpectedly returned home early from a business trip and discovered that her husband was cheating on her with his secretary. It's strange that we have a common experience now. Maybe we can share our stories and compare notes. Jerry mentioned that she is a partner in a corporate law firm and is coming here to open a new office for their company. It looks like she will move here to supervise the work of the office. Maybe she can help you find a competent divorce lawyer. I'll definitely ask about it when I see her tomorrow. The next evening, I met Jerry and Ashley at a nearby Mexican diner. Jerry wasn't exaggerating when he talked about his sister's stunning looks. She greeted me warmly, hugging me affectionately and giving me a gentle peck on the cheek. At the same time, Ashley, who was a young girl with braces and pigtails, underwent an amazing transformation. She laughed playfully and remarked, I grew up and turned into a woman. Do you remember how you teased me about my braces? So what do you think now? Without hesitation, I replied that she had turned into one of the most exquisite women I had ever met. During dinner, Ashley and I discussed my current situation. Jerry provided her with all the necessary information, and we both decided that due to the ongoing investigation, it was necessary to maintain confidentiality between us. Jerry, however, mentioned that I had the opportunity to share photos and videos, simply pointing out that a private investigator was involved in the case. I informed them that Carrie was going to file for divorce upon her return from Paris, citing irreconcilable differences. Ashley treated this as nonsense and suggested that I take proactive measures. She recommended an excellent family lawyer who will diligently handle my case. One of the most outstanding professionals in her field, she has honed her experience in handling divorce cases related to adultery. She skillfully achieved a favorable outcome for me, leaving my ex-husband in a difficult position. Her contact details are stored in my hotel room. We can get them later. Let's start the proceedings on Monday so that Carrie receives the necessary legal documents upon her return from Paris. Events unfolded rapidly, but one thing was clear to me. Ashley left a lasting impression, and I couldn't help but wonder if she would be interested in dating me. As we were nearing the end of dinner, Jerry's phone interrupted our conversation. He left the table for a while and returned with a message that he needed to leave urgently. He insisted on paying, but I kindly reminded him that I wanted to treat him. After enjoying Margarita, Ashley and I got ready to leave. She expressed a desire to continue the evening with dancing and asked if I knew a suitable place. Without hesitation, I answered, Yes, there is a place nearby. We spent a couple of hours dancing, sipping beer and having a lot of fun. To say that we communicated well would be an understatement. Our compatibility was obvious, and I found comfort and happiness in her arms. Eventually, we went back to the restaurant to pick up her car. 
She asked me to accompany her to the hotel to get a card from the lawyer she recommended. I agreed and followed her to the room, where she took a card out of her bag and handed it to me. Her contact details were listed on the card, including her mobile phone number. I was asked to call her tomorrow and arrange a meeting on Monday. I assured her that I would personally contact her to warn her in advance. I thanked Ashley for her help and asked how I could thank her. At that moment she spoke, hugged me tightly and kissed me passionately. I returned the kiss. We collapsed onto the bed, our lips locked in a passionate embrace as if time had ceased to exist. After a few tense minutes, we reluctantly pulled away from each other, gasping for air. Ashley, I've wanted to kiss you since the first time I saw you, I confessed, and my heart began to pound with desire. Ashley's response was immediate and no less fervent. Shane, you are incredibly handsome and radiate irresistible attractiveness. Unable to resist each other any longer, we resumed our passionate kissing session, and our hands dared to explore further. Stunned by the intensity of our connection, we paused again, letting the words hang in the air without sounding out. Ashley, maybe we should not rush things yet. Considering that your divorce was recently finalized, I don't want to exploit your vulnerability. Shane, I appreciate your concern, but I assure you that I am capable of making my own decisions. Otherwise, I can take advantage of you. You undoubtedly attract me, and I hope that the feeling is mutual. When I found out about my husband's affair with his secretary, I couldn't help but wonder. Was it my fault in any way? But I came to the conclusion that this is definitely not the case. I am young and attractive enough. I think I'm attractive and it's his fault. I hope you don't feel responsible for Carrie's departure. Last night I couldn't help but wonder if I was the cause of all this. Was I a negligent husband? Have I not been able to satisfy all the needs of my wife? But after spending time with you today, I realized that it wasn't my fault. I was a devoted father, husband, and lover, providing everything I could. We exchanged kisses and mostly hugged on the bed. It was incredibly pleasant to be with her. The next morning we woke up, still wrapped in each other's arms. I gave her an invitation, inviting her to join me for a delicious lunch followed by an adventurous horseback ride. The afternoon was great, and Ashley enjoyed our horseback ride immensely. After a day, we ended up on my couch, where passion flared up again, but everything was limited to an intense session of passionate kisses. Together, we decided to continue our acquaintance and let fate guide us. To fully commit myself to this endeavor, I took a day off from work on Monday and met with Julia, the lawyer Ashley recommended. There I told my story, presenting all the weighty evidence I had collected. It was obvious that Julia was shocked by my wife's behavior and behavior. Given her rich 30 years of experience, it seemed that she had already encountered similar situations. Julia suggested that we conduct divorce proceedings based on adultery and abandonment of the child. As part of the settlement agreement, we would demand ownership of the house, ranch, and all related assets. Besides, we had $10,000, which we would split equally. I will remain the sole owner of the funds in our checking account. Considering that my wife was already responsible for car payments and her credit card was issued in her name, she would have retained these responsibilities as well. I took care of the car and medical insurance. Julia advised me to cancel both policies as soon as possible. In addition, all credit cards that were in our joint ownership had to be cancelled. Most of these cards were gasoline-powered, with zero balance. Julia made sure that all my needs were met. She mentioned that explicit intimate photos and videos will only be used if absolutely necessary. Julia was wondering when Carrie would be back from Paris, and I informed her that it was scheduled for Thursday morning. I gave Julia the address Carrie had left for me. Julia mentioned that the summons would be ready on Thursday morning. Although she may not like the adultery aspect, I believe she will agree to everything else. Judging by Julia's statements, she is happy with her new financial situation and is eager to complete the divorce as soon as possible in order to marry Mr. Brockman. I will inform her that I am ready to amend the adultery clause if she agrees to sign the papers in their current form. Julia responded positively, 
saying it was a good idea. We just want her to admit her infidelity. Around 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, I got a call on my cell phone. Since I had no classes at that time, I decided to answer. Carrie was on the other end, and she sounded very upset. Shane, what do these divorce papers that I just received mean? She exclaimed. Confused, I replied, Carrie, I never agreed to file for divorce. I assured her that my intentions were solely for the speedy fulfillment of her wishes. Why is it talking about adultery and abandonment of a child, Shane? I thought we had settled on irreconcilable differences, Carrie asked. I clarified it again. Harry, let me stress that I have never agreed to any specific terms or actions regarding our divorce. By the looks of it, judging by your words, you will most likely agree to this agreement. After his imprisonment, you will soon become the wife of a rich man. To continue the process, I propose replacing the terms adultery and abandonment with irreconcilable differences. If you are ready to sign the agreement in its current form, please send me a corrected copy. Then I'll give it to Ben's lawyer for review. If they approve, I will start signing the documents. I immediately contacted Julia to inform her about my conversation with Carrie, and it completely coincided with her previous forecast. She had already prepared the new documents that needed to be sent. This person is a corporate lawyer and has no experience in divorce cases. It is likely that he will ignore the question and advise her to just sign the documents. As expected, Julia's prediction turned out to be accurate once again. Carrie signed the paperwork, and by Friday afternoon they were back at Julia's office. On the way home from work, I stopped at home to sign the documents too. The divorce will be officially finalized within 60 days. I contacted Ashley and we agreed to meet for dinner near her new place of work. We had a nice lunch and talked for about two hours. I felt like I desperately needed to talk and so did she. So I poured out my heart to her. We made a deal not to indulge in extravagant entertainment today, like going to Hank's or buying new underwear. Instead, we decided to save up money for a special Saturday night. Carrie called me in the evening. She greeted me with a warm, hi honey, but I couldn't let her use affectionate words anymore. I sternly informed her that she had lost this privilege. Despite the pain she caused me, I assured her that I could handle it. It didn't matter to me anymore because she got what she wanted, and unfortunately I was no longer part of that equation. I offer my deepest apologies. It was not my intention to harm you. My love for you is still strong, and I want you to know that I will miss you very much. Carrie, I understand that you treated my words with disdain. I suppose you noticed in the settlement agreement that I'm ending your car and health insurance. I'm giving you until next Friday to arrange for a new insurance policy. Thanks, Shane. Please don't worry. Ben will handle all the necessary matters. I didn't express concern. I just wanted you to be aware. Well, it looks like this is our goodbye, Shane. I hope you don't think I'm a terrible person for taking this step. I had no choice but to do what was necessary. Shane, I have a deep affection for you. When these emotions overwhelmed me, tears welled up in my eyes. I felt that Carrie knew about my feelings. It was with a heavy heart that I said goodbye to Carrie, hoping that she would be happy with her new partner. Before she could say another word, I abruptly ended the conversation. It was time to embark on a new journey, and I had carefully thought out plans in which Ashley played an important role. On Saturday evening at 6 o'clock, Ashley arrived at my residence, radiating beauty and charm. Let me paint a vivid picture of what I saw. She is about 5 feet 9 inches tall. Her gorgeous blonde hair cascades down, complementing her long, graceful legs. Her curvy figure fascinates me, and the perfectly chiseled lower body thrills me. She embodies the essence of a divine being, a real goddess in my eyes. I am attracted by her full lips, longing for the gentle touch of our kisses. Her evening outfit is a delightful little red dress that accentuates her curves. It exuded charming elegance and at the same time revealed a hint of cleavage. The sight of her in this dress made an undeniable impression on me, causing me to feel a growing tension that strained against the fabric of my jeans. We shared a delicious dinner together, 
enjoying the peaceful atmosphere of my terrace overlooking the expanses of my ranch. The evening was accompanied by an abundance of wine, which enhanced the fun of our time together. We savored mouth-watering dishes and enjoyed the rich taste of our chosen drinks, deeply immersed in each other's company. We chatted and talked playfully for about two hours. In the end, she looked into my eyes and said, Darling, if you don't put me to bed soon, I might just burst. Without hesitation, I gently lifted her in my arms and led her to my bedroom. Quickly taking off our clothes, we eagerly began to enjoy each other's company. Over the course of several weeks, Ashley and I spent countless hours together. Although I expressed a desire for her to move in with us, she advised me to wait until her divorce was officially finalized. But she continued to spend nights in my bed. About five days before the divorce was finalized, Jerry contacted me by phone. He informed me that they were on the verge of taking serious action against Brockman and his business. According to Jerry, they have solid evidence and numerous witnesses that will lead to the arrest of all Brockman's property and assets. Consequently, he faces a long prison term. Concerned, I asked how Carrie would be involved in this case. Jerry assured me that although she would be questioned, her involvement in the case was unlikely. But anyway, unfortunately she will lose the financial support of her benefactor. After we finish he will be left with nothing. Shane, she's in trouble. I guess that's her concern, Jerry. Shane, I want you to understand how much my sister values a relationship with you. After the divorce, she was extremely depressed. Maybe there is a chance that one day you will become my son-in-law? I hope so, Jerry. Ultimately, it depends on whether she wants me. I can assure you that I have deep feelings for your sister. She feels the same way about you, Shane. I'll let you know when we make a move on Brockman. I have a feeling you should call Carrie. It was finally Friday, and I was looking forward to spending the weekend with Ashley. Today also marked the official end of my marriage to Carrie. On my way home from work, I stopped by the store to buy some beer for the upcoming weekend. What happened next can be attributed to fate, luck, justice, or perhaps something inexplicable. Suddenly, Carrie called me. She expressed a desire to meet face to face. Despite my initial hesitation, I agreed to have lunch with her. I invited Ashley to join us, but she already knew what Carrie had come to me for. She entrusted it to me, and I decided to solve it alone. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I took a week off, intending to quit as soon as a suitable replacement was found. At the same time, we were preoccupied with the task of moving Ashley to me. To discuss business, Carrie and I agreed to meet at a charming restaurant in the city center. This was my suggestion. When I looked at her, my surprise was palpable. She gained a little weight and didn't look very healthy. Undoubtedly, the last few days have been difficult for her. The news has been relentlessly covering events and even repeatedly mentioning her name. When she came in, I couldn't help but notice the stares and whispers. There were even rumors about her relationship with Brockman. Wanting to be alone, we decided to sit outside, in a more open place. Choosing a table away from prying eyes, we sat down to talk. At first, we had a light conversation, but it didn't take long for her tears to flow. Shane, she confessed, her voice shaking. Leaving you was the most serious mistake I've ever made. And not just because of Ben's arrest. I realized this a few weeks after I moved in with him. It seemed exciting at first, but the appeal of money quickly evaporated. I felt unhappy and the thought of being close to him made me feel sick. It wasn't what I expected. When she left, it became clear that money was her only concern. Carrie kept talking about how she couldn't help but feel guilty for the pain I caused Casey and me. Casey hardly talks to me anymore. You don't deserve anything like this, Shane. You were a wonderful husband and breadwinner. I had everything I needed, but I couldn't figure it out. I'm grateful for your words, Carrie. Thank you for acknowledging this. But your actions were dictated by your dissatisfaction with me. On the other hand, I was happy with our relationship, Shane. 
Unfortunately I let the older man's influence cloud my thoughts. He manipulated me into leaving you for him and his wealth. The night before he was arrested, he forced me to commit a humiliating act. He is a disgusting, vile man, and I sincerely hope that he will be punished in prison. Although I felt a hint of amusement, I restrained myself from smiling. Carrie, why all this? What are you trying to get from me? With tears in her eyes, she looked up and spoke. My affection for you is very deep, and I am overwhelmed by the immense longing that I feel in your absence. The memories of our precious moments at home, on the ranch, and the time spent with the horses fill my heart. I am ready to do anything to make amends. But Carrie, I can't help but wonder if your longing for me isn't caused by your current problems with finances, housing, and work. As for me, Shane, I am in a desperate situation, with neither the means nor the purpose. Despite the circumstances, my feelings for you remain unshakable. I sincerely wish that everything would return to normal. It's important to remember that when you walked out the door, I made it clear that this was the last straw. I declared that there would be no turning back, and your departure would be final. I know Shane, but I really need your presence. My situation has become unbearable, and I no longer have anyone to seek solace from. I'm deeply sorry, Carrie, but I had feelings for someone else and we fell in love. Although we decided to get married eventually, we are in no hurry because of the painful experiences we both had with our former partners. Carrie's expression turned into immeasurable shock and suffering, and tears flowed down her face. She never seemed to think about the fact that I could leave too. She remained sitting there sobbing uncontrollably, and I couldn't help but sympathize with her at that moment. After I thought about revenge after she left, my point of view changed, and now I want to help her. Carrie, is there anything I can do to help you get back on your feet? She looked up and answered, I guess I was stupid to think that you would decide to take me back. I don't blame you because I wouldn't accept myself either. If you can find the strength to lend me some money until I find a job in my own place, I will be very grateful to you. I'm living with a friend now, but I really want to get my own apartment or something like that. How much do you need, Carrie? If you could lend me $5,000, that would be very helpful. As soon as I find a job, I will immediately start paying off your debt. When the food arrived, the waiter put it on the table. Carrie began to devour the food greedily, while my appetite remained muted. Watching her devour her food, I thought for a moment. Taking my checkbook out of my pocket, I carefully wrote out the check and discreetly handed it to her. I said softly, Carrie, may this help you start a new chapter in your life? Your exemplary secretarial skills should make it easier for you to find a job. If you have any difficulties, please let me know, and I will consider possible solutions. I deeply regret the unfortunate turn of events. I imagined a future with you, growing old together, Casey's wedding, and the moments when our grandchildren would go on their first horseback ride. I even imagined how we would rest side by side on a serene ranch. Unfortunately, it seems fate had other plans. Feeling dejected, I got up from my seat and headed for the exit of the restaurant. Trying to pay the bill and leave a generous tip, I left a hundred dollar bill on the table. Looking back, I saw her opening the check, and her face showed complete disbelief. Our eyes met for a moment, but she remained stunned. To my delight, I wrote a not very kind message on the receipt. Smiling with satisfaction, I left, leaving her to deal with the unexpected message. As I walked to the car, Ashley stood on the porch and watched me intently. Our relationship blossomed, and the following spring we exchanged vows. Jerry, my closest friend, took on the role of best man, and Casey, Ashley's dearest friend, had the honor of becoming a bridesmaid. Their friendship has flourished for a long time. We decided to tie the knot at a magnificent ceremony in Vegas, organized at Caesar's Palace. A select group of friends and family were invited to share our special day, attending both the wedding and the subsequent reception. To add an extra touch of luxury, we held a reception in the walls of our honeymoon suite. The atmosphere was filled with joy and laughter, 
everyone was enjoying the holiday. And to top it all off, luck smiled on me when I hit the jackpot of over $200,000 on a progressive slot machine. It seems that fate has decreed that I am destined to make a considerable fortune through gambling. Although Carrie wasn't officially invited, she came across an ad in a local newspaper. Fortunately, Carrie managed to get a job and find a place to live. As expected, she never returned the borrowed money, and I did not expect otherwise. I heard that she is currently dating a high school teacher, and I sincerely hope that their relationship will develop. On another note, Ben Brockman appeared in court and was found guilty of federal crimes. Accordingly, all of his property was confiscated in order to reimburse the funds he fraudulently received from the federal government. He will have to serve a significant term in federal prison. Perhaps during his stay there, he will find someone with whom he can make friends. We were back in the familiar waiting room at the office of the marital therapist my wife had chosen. This is our 12th appointment, and few of our therapists know that it will be the last one. I prepared a surprise for both my wife and our therapist, allowing them to experience the consequences of our sessions without my presence. From now on, they can get together to figure out what went wrong, and my wife can take care of the financial aspects. It's a shame to be a part of such a story, which you often hear about from therapists. But I never thought that I would experience it personally. She is usually called a charlatan. She has a strong aversion to men, and it's very simple. Its main task is to support and justify women and their negative actions. Despite my concerns, my objections were ignored by my wife, who decided to choose her. This is not surprising. We could use a more productive approach. Choose a qualified psychotherapist together, interview several candidates, strengthen confidence in our choice, and take on difficult work as a whole team. Unfortunately, this is not how events unfolded. Ruth wanted to manipulate the course of the meetings, making sure that everything worked out in her favor. It's not that I'm against therapy, but I firmly believe that what we're experiencing here is not real therapy. Every complaint my wife makes seems to be redirected to me, with a constant reminder that I have not been able to meet her needs. But as of today, this narrative ends. Perhaps it's worth thinking about the events that led us to this moment. We tied the knot right after graduating from college, a quarter of a century ago. We have a son and a daughter who are currently in college. These wonderful children never cease to amaze me. Despite the difficulties we faced due to the frequent absence of their mother, I aspired to be the best father I could be. In fact, my dedication was so obvious that the children jokingly called me Dom, a playful combination of dad and mom, in recognition of my tireless efforts to fill the void left by their mother's absence. At first, this nickname made me feel uncomfortable, but soon I realized that my children recognized my dual role as a caring mother and devoted father. By preparing their school lunches and helping them with their homework, I took full responsibility for both parenting roles. I often accompanied my children to small and football matches, attended parent-teacher conferences and did household chores, such as cooking and washing dishes. At the same time, my wife's involvement boiled down to the fact that she constantly stressed the importance of her low-paying job, complained about me, and felt too exhausted to participate in many other things but it would be unfair to say that she did not participate at all. Over time, however, it became noticeable that her attention shifted from her family to matters outside our home. The initial complaints about her work eventually turned into complaints directed at me. It seemed like no matter what I did, it was never enough or done right. Our financial situation, the quality of our vacation, and any other aspects that she found unsatisfactory became the only subject of her dissatisfaction. As our children grew up, they witnessed this constant dissatisfaction, but they always tried to express their appreciation to me, and that made it all worthwhile. Like in the classic story of how to cook a frog, I became this frog. But then the tipping point came, and I decided to jump out of the pot. Throughout my adult years, I have devoted a lot of time to unraveling the difficult moments of my wife's troubled past. Raised in a dysfunctional family, 
She resembled a chilling fairy tale from the depths of horror, where parents rule over their children. Her mother, a serial cheater, shamelessly used her daughter to hide her infidelities. During these innocent shopping trips, she was taught that it was strictly forbidden to reveal the truth to her father. Although her father had intelligence, his lack of strength prevented him from intervening. He was a man shattered beyond recognition, just a whisper in the chaos of life. His timid nature did not allow him to maintain a meaningful conversation, and after a long day at work, he sought solace in drinking. But this temporary escape only added fuel to the fire that was waiting for him at home. The once peaceful sanctuary has turned into a relentless battlefield, devoid of genuine connection, shared moments, and happiness. From an early age, my wife learned to anticipate the impending darkness of the night. She would pick up a few pieces of food and retire to her bedroom, protecting herself from the violent war that consumed the rest of the house. Isn't it amazing that in the end, she became what she became? Deception and manipulation were her experiences, and it took me many years to realize that she was deeply flawed and incapable of truly dedicating herself to marriage. Accepting this understanding eased my pain, and loving our children made me stay until they reached adulthood. For a while, I sought solace in psychotherapy, where I described in detail a repetitive pattern of behavior and shared my thoughts about Ruth's upbringing. I was constantly looking for advice on how to fix a gradually crumbling marriage. With unwavering patience, she reminded me that she could only give advice to the one in front of her me. She taught me how to take care of myself, stand up for my own needs, and refuse to be consumed by the abyss that Ruth's existence has become. Thanks to her guidance, I realized how important it is to give preference to my children, live for them, and at the same time leave the door ajar in case Ruth decides to return and reunite our family. As the years passed, our children went to college, and I had a deep feeling that the inevitable denouement was approaching. The current state of affairs had become unbearable, and I firmly believed that Ruth would eventually end our marriage. Interestingly, my own therapist shed light on this issue by explaining that when a child is raised in a turbulent environment, he gets used to it. This may seem unusual, but she informed me that whenever life started going smoothly, Ruth deliberately disrupted it, as chaos was her preferred state of comfort. This revelation brought me a sense of relief, allowing me to understand that my sanity was not in doubt. Although I noticed a recurring pattern, I was skeptical about its validity. But now that our kids had gone to college, our finances had stabilized, the house was close to full payment, and we finally had enough free time to enjoy each other's company, it seemed inevitable that she would sabotage it all. Just as I was lost in my thoughts, the door to the inner office opened and another couple entered the reception area. The husband looked tearful, and his wife radiated satisfaction. It was clear that the therapist had earned money from their session. By that time, I was already well acquainted with the daily routine. The usual pattern was to wait patiently for the peculiar therapist to finish writing down his thoughts about our previous session, and then the door would swing open. Ruth, it's time for you and David, she announced, implying that the consequences had already been removed and it was time to introduce the next unsuspecting subject. Ruth took her place on the couch, while the therapist always expected me to sit next to her. But this time I deliberately chose the chair to Ruth's right, with my back to the entrance. David, sit next to your wife, the therapist asked. I'm sorry, but you can see her better from this place. Besides, the sofa has always been uncomfortable for me and now my back is bothering me. To say that it is inconvenient would be an understatement. The doctor looks annoyed and says, David, is there anything you want to add after our previous session? Of course I have something to say. Despite our constant efforts to work on the marriage, I can't get rid of the feeling that my wife is unfaithful to me. It's something I just can't let go of. No matter what is said, my opinion remains unchanged. This man doesn't even give my wife a chance to speak out. 
David, I have already stressed my absolute confidence that Ruth is not cheating on you. After a thorough conversation with her, I am convinced that your suspicions are groundless. It is extremely important for you to leave this issue and move forward. Without even waiting for my answer, she turns directly to Ruth, asking about the topic of today's conversation. She certainly didn't hide her biased point of view, did she? Ruth scrolled through my list of shortcomings and settled on one thing. Lack of support. That single thought infuriated her. She started complaining that I didn't approve of her staying late at work and dreamed of nighttime get-togethers with her friends to relax. Monotonous complaints poured out of Ruth's mouth, and the therapist just nodded, as in all other sessions. Knowing that Ruth would continue to express her thoughts for some time, I allowed myself to be distracted. During the initial stages of our therapy, during a personal session, I confessed to the therapist my suspicions that my wife had been unfaithful in the past. Despite the lack of concrete evidence and the fact that it was just an intuitive feeling, our therapist dismissed my concerns and insisted that it was all a figment of my imagination. But two months passed, and my doubts turned into confidence, and her opinion became unimportant, and I prepared for battle. Although it took me a while to collect my thoughts and make the necessary preparations, I was determined to face the truth face to face. David, could you concentrate for a minute? Oh yes, I heard you. I don't really support her. Ruth mentioned that you neglect her and her needs. You don't support her when she has to stay late at work, and you seem to be jealous when she wants to spend time with her friends. To be honest, I can't shake the uneasy feeling that she's not faithful to our marriage. The so-called expert could no longer hide his contempt. David, it's time to face the truth and act like an adult. I assure you, she is not cheating on you. Your spouse needs a partner who is able to take responsibility and effectively cope with tasks. But if you continue your behavior, she may think about looking for a companion elsewhere. The supposed expert expressed her disappointment by shaking her head. Ruth, please continue. The complaints piled up as she talked about how he neglected his household duties, such as lawn maintenance and the exterior of the house. While I was silently reflecting on the situation, the complaints began to repeat themselves. I have the ability to identify a song by just three notes. It seems that I inadvertently revealed my innermost thoughts. How careless of me. David, why do you have such a mischievous smile? We're doing important business here, and your fun is inappropriate. I apologize for my inept apologies. But despite my sincere regrets, my thoughts began to wander again while my wife continued to mumble. Ruth always insists on having her own car when we meet with a questionable person. Meanwhile, I diligently perform my duties at work. I thought about the possibility of picking her up and going with her, but quickly discarded the idea. It was an inappropriate decision. Strangely enough, she was always unavailable in the afternoon after our meetings. Although it took me a while to figure it out, I eventually took action. I decided to hire a private investigator to keep an eye on her in the afternoon. As expected, after each session, she met Bill Peterson at the Best Western Hotel near the highway. I have expanded the scope of surveillance by providing it exclusively on Thursdays. I couldn't help but wonder why they didn't use every opportunity for secret meetings. It was becoming increasingly obvious that their illicit affair had originated not so long ago. It had been going on for quite a long time. At that moment, I realized that she was also keeping her adulterous boyfriend at bay. She couldn't let him get too close to her. Her distress was obvious. They had a constant reservation of rooms, which allowed my private detective to get a camera and a dictaphone. Once I was convinced of this, therapy turned into a waiting game while I organized myself. At that moment, I had to defeat three opponents, my wife, Bill, and an untrustworthy therapist. When the time came, I decided to confront Bill's wife and provide her with copies of all the necessary evidence. Cooperating with my lawyer, she used her legal knowledge. Although I couldn't help but worry about her fragile health, 
My lawyer assured me that her long-standing physical problems would allow her to successfully obtain significant compensation from Bill. This outcome was the justification I had been seeking for so long. Excuse me, David? David, could you focus and be attentive? Oh yes, I heard you. It looks like the house needs a fresh coat of paint. And what is your decision? At that moment, our conversation was interrupted by a knock. Who could it be? The therapist got up from his seat and said, I'll take care of it. It looks like it's meant for me. David, this is our therapy session. This time should be sacred and dedicated exclusively to our conversation. Why are you making plans outside of this session? Without giving her time to finish her sentence, I quickly opened the door and saw Bill and his gentle wife Marie standing in front of me. Welcome, welcome, I exclaimed, glad that they had arrived just in time. I am glad that you could come. Please come into the office. Bill had a puzzled expression on his face, while Marie, despite her fragility, radiated determination. Despite the trembling of her hands, a symptom of her neurological disease, she resolutely inserted a cane on each step and purposefully walked into the room. It was obvious that Bill still didn't know about my identity. Holding out his hand, he said, My wife has scheduled this meeting. To be honest, I'm not really sure about the purpose of our presence here. Shifting my gaze to the right, I gestured at my wife sitting on the couch and continued, Bill, you know my wife Ruth, don't you? I've already heard about her, but this is the first time I've seen her. His face turned ashen, and he was clearly in shock. Here is the concrete evidence supporting my claims. I discovered their secret conversations, hidden messages, and even saw them together more than once. So there's no need to sugarcoat it, Bill. We all know the truth. This therapy session is a safe space for candor and solving our problems. I have a lot of photos and videos of them both having fun at Best Western. Turning to Bill, I suggested, Bill, why don't you sit down next to Ruth? If you can be intimate with her, then at least you can sit next to her while we deal with this unpleasant matter. Turning my attention to Marie, I gave her a friendly kiss on the cheek and noticed, Marie, I'm always glad to see you. Would you be interested in this chair? Surprisingly, it's quite comfortable. Smiling, she settled into her seat, piercing her husband with her gaze. I settled into the chair opposite her, the coffee table serving as a barrier between us. Ruth and Bill were sitting on my right, and the eccentric man on my left continued to make unusual facial expressions, his mouth opening and closing without a single sound. Isn't that nice? I remarked. Marie, you look just amazing, as always. How are you feeling today? I asked. Better than usual, David. Thanks for asking. I think the burden will be lifted from my shoulders soon. I couldn't help but smile when I heard Marie's comment. She faced numerous challenges and an uncertain future, but her unwavering optimism and positive attitude were truly inspiring. Earlier, Miss Jacobs assured me that my suspicions of Ruth's infidelity were just a figment of my imagination, which Marie found amusing. After looking around the room, I asked if anyone would like to see the photos. I also mentioned that I have a tablet handy if anyone wants to watch a movie. Turning my gaze to the dubious person, I noticed. What about you? Would you be interested in witnessing this unpleasant situation when someone enters into an affair with my wife despite the fact that you previously denied her existence? No? You seem to have suddenly become very quiet. I turned my attention to Bill and said, You know, Bill, Having an intimate relationship with my wife is one thing, but I have been her devoted husband for a considerable period of time, and despite her deception and betrayal, I still feel responsible for her well-being. You tend to treat her disdainfully as an object. Have you ever thought that you can show her love and intimacy? Perhaps her preferences have changed. I looked at Ruth, thinking that if I had known she wanted this kind of treatment, I wouldn't have started a secret affair with this disgusting coward. It was amazing to watch her cry. I couldn't quite figure it out. It was obvious that our marriage, like Bill's, was over. Now she was free to pursue Bill or any other man she wanted. So why are there such tears all of a sudden? She was only losing me, and it was obvious that from the very beginning she never really wanted me. 
except for the emotional support that I offered and that she couldn't give herself. Eventually, Ruth found her own voice. I never wanted you to know the truth. I'm deeply sorry, David. It was never my intention to hurt you. She kept repeating the typical cliches of the cheaters one after another. It was so pathetic that it bordered on the comic. Stop crying, Ruth. You've had a whole year to think about your actions. Glancing at the pathetic semblance of a man next to her, I asked, What about you? Your wife has raised two children who are now independent. She has special requirements. And how did you repay her? Secretly from her? Have you ever thought about taking responsibility and being truthful for once in your miserable existence? I could feel the rising anger reflected on his face, and I was fully prepared to confront him if the opportunity presented itself. But that moment never came. As a result, they both remained sitting, giving meaningless excuses and insincere apologies, until a sudden knock interrupted the tense atmosphere. Oops, I glanced at Marie, realizing that the last visitor had arrived. Until now the charlatan had been surprisingly silent, but this caused her to have a new fit of anger. I shrugged my shoulders dispassionately and began to unlock the door. A man of medium height, slightly older, in an obviously inexpensive suit entered the office. Glancing at the sofa, I motioned for him to pass. Those two faces over there, I said quietly. With purposeful steps, he approached the two deceived people and imperceptibly handed each of them an ordinary manila envelope. In a calm and collected tone, he said, Ruth Harper, Bill Peterson, you have been officially notified. After taking a quick photo, he hurriedly turned away. That was the end of his task. It occurred to me that this was probably the first time he had performed such a task in the office of a marriage therapist. He grinned ominously as he passed by, and then quietly left the room. I closed the door behind him and sat back down in the chair. What a stormy day it was, wouldn't you agree? Glancing at the clock on the wall, I noticed that our time was almost up. Maybe in the remaining minutes, Miss Jacobs will help the cheaters make sense of the events that unfolded here today. Turning to her, I couldn't resist adding a note of sarcasm to my tone. Perhaps you can understand how wrong your ideas are? I got up, helped Marie up, and taking her hand, left the room. Moving leisurely down the corridor, I asked, Are you going to be okay? I think so, she replied. When you revealed the evidence of their deception, I felt completely confused. I doubted how the person I was married to could commit such an act against me. But now I realize that he no longer embodies the qualities of the man I once married. Thinking about the man I thought I married, I realized that all I was losing was just a memory or a made-up image of something that I thought existed, but actually wasn't. It dawned on me that she was expressing our shared feelings. Looking at me, she said, I still have children, and in a few years our grandchildren will join us. I'll be fine. You still have friends. Remember this, and maybe one day you will include me in this circle. A melancholy smile graced her face. Gently squeezing my hand, she assured me, I've already turned it on. With a glimmer of hope, I suggested, In that case, how about joining a friend for lunch? Her face lit up with a sincere smile, the first one I've seen all day. I would be very happy about that, she replied. Different cars took us to the lunch place, where a gloomy atmosphere prevailed and we silently recalled the tragic events. Despite our joint decision and careful planning, the culmination of two marriages was undoubtedly depressing. When our lives, which we had spent time and effort building and considered durable, came to an end, we started talking. We thought about this question for a while, and finally came to the conclusion that it was time to embark on a new path. Our conversation turned to our children and various events taking place in our city. To my surprise, we discovered that we had several mutual acquaintances, and I felt confident knowing that these people would support us both. It dawned on me that as soon as this chapter is over, our friends will inevitably try to arrange blind dates with their lonely acquaintances. Just thinking about it sent an involuntary shiver down my spine. 
Laughing softly, she reassured me, saying that everything would not be as terrible as I had feared. Moreover, she added, there is a chance that I will even find some pleasure in it. Despite her words, I could only shake my head in disbelief and sigh. But as we continued to talk, my optimism about our future began to grow. By the time I got home, I realized that I no longer cared about the location of these cheaters or how they got there. Whether they teamed up to develop a defense strategy, sought legal help, or just went on their usual weekly date. It no longer mattered to me. Despite the fact that Marie had his car, she most likely still gave him a ride. But the situation was far from simple. After Ruth returned home, she offered numerous apologies and even several accusations, since it is often customary in society to blame her husband when a woman cheats. I doubted that the therapist was still directing her actions. When Ruth ran out of breath and started sobbing, I realized it was my turn to speak. I spoke briefly and directly. Throughout our marriage I have deeply empathized with your past, Ruth. The environment in which you were raised was nothing more than a waking nightmare. I believed that despite the scars she left on you, you managed to get out relatively unscathed. I hoped that by offering you a truly loving partnership, you would be able to find solace and turn into the woman you aspire to be. But I didn't realize that your healing ability was severely compromised. You are fundamentally broken. Despite all our steps towards progress, whenever life seemed to be on a positive trajectory, you destroy everything. It is impossible for you to find happiness. All you understand is grief and harm. I can't live like this anymore next to someone who cheats and betrays. Our relationship is over, Ruth. Our children have grown up, and it's time for us to go our separate ways. I took a pause to let her process what I had said before expressing my last thoughts. Ruth, it's very important that you seek professional help. Genuine therapy is what you really need. Find a therapist who doesn't just blindly agree with you and supports your actions. It's also important to let them take the lead during sessions, even if you prefer to be in control. Trying to control all aspects won't get you where you need to be. You need an experienced specialist who will help you with self-analysis, help you cope with the emotional scars of the past and overcome them. Please give me a promise that you will seek real help. I'm not sure if she really heard my words. Her mind seemed to be clouded by numerous barriers preventing her from accepting any instruction. Unfortunately, the painful reality is that she lacked the courage to confront her inner problems. I must admit that when I thought about the decision to end my marriage with Ruth, I felt confused. My mind has repeatedly returned to our vows, especially the commitment to support each other in sickness and in health. Undoubtedly Ruth was not in the best condition. In the end, I came to the conclusion that despite her illness, she is aware of good and evil, and betrayal remains betrayal. Three years have passed since that fateful meeting with the therapist, and since then, I have managed to move forward. A little over two years ago, a divorce was formalized, during which we divided our lives in half. As part of the settlement agreement, I was obliged to provide financial support for three years. Now, with less than a year left, I'm reflecting on what I've learned along the way. When love dissipates and anger subsides, only an overwhelming feeling of sadness and emptiness remains. To tell the truth, I had already lost what I had long before the divorce. If I had the opportunity at all, I've lost the potential of what could have been. But do not dwell on what has been lost. This is not the way to move through life. I decided to move to another area of the city, keeping my friends, who eventually became my biggest source of support. By focusing again on the activities that I have always treasured, but which I often sacrificed because of my wife's desires, I rebuilt my life. During this journey, I accidentally met an incredible woman who has the same passions as me. After having our hearts broken in the past, we carefully develop our relationship I keep a positive attitude, but I don't feel in a hurry. As for Bill, I decided to let him off the hook. Revenge wasn't worth jeopardizing my freedom. 
In addition, Marie counted on his financial support, so he needed to continue earning. I think he got what he deserved. After all, this whole ordeal has taught me a valuable lesson. I realized that by staying true to ourselves, we can restore a full life, perhaps even better than before. Let's focus on the future and take advantage of the opportunities that life offers us. But when it comes to my ex, I doubt her ability to find happiness. Embodying the joys of life and truly living it is not something that comes naturally to her. Instead, she constantly strives for something more than what she has now, often sacrificing what is really important. In addition, she stubbornly resists putting herself into the lives of those around her. I'm sad to see her like this, but now I know that I cannot change her essence and I can only move forward. Let me introduce myself. I am Ted, a middle-aged man living in New York City. After two decades of marriage, my wife Katie and I, who was 47 at the time, decided to separate. Our separation led to a divorce. I am currently 52 years old. Our wonderful son Ron is studying in another city, and now he is 19 years old. Running a small business turned out to be a very profitable business for me. But almost a quarter of a century ago, fate led me to an unforgettable meeting with Katie. It happened on a Friday night in a noisy bar in the heart of New York City. Surrounded by friends and over drinks, I couldn't help but be captivated by the irresistible charm of Katie sitting at the other end of the room. Intrigued, I plucked up the courage and approached her, and to my delight, a deep connection immediately arose between us. We talked endlessly that evening, and I was completely charmed by her quick wit and quick thinking. Katie possessed an unstoppable spirit filled with vitality and an unwavering zeal for life. After that memorable evening at the bar, our bond became even deeper, and soon we went on a romantic trip. Over time, our bond has become even stronger, and I have no doubt that she is the one. In the serene embrace of Central Park, under the majestic roof of an elegant oak tree, I knelt down and proposed. Overwhelmed with joy, she readily agreed. We had an intimate wedding ceremony, celebrating our love in a modest setting. We had a small and special ceremony attended only by our dearest friends and family. Throughout my successful business career, financial worries never made themselves felt. Living in New York, I have always provided Katie with a comfortable lifestyle, providing her with many opportunities. Many of Katie's friends were married to wealthy men and led a luxurious and carefree existence, enjoying the privileges that accompanied their spouse's wealth. Many of them divorced soon after the wedding and received substantial monthly alimony from their ex-husbands. I constantly advised Katie to distance herself from these people, whom she called friends, because I never had a favorable opinion of them. I despised the days when I had to pick Katie up from gatherings with these friends. On several occasions, some of them even tried to take care of me. I decided not to tell Katie about these incidents and just ignored them. Katie always assured me that her friends would never affect her love for me and our family. Believing her words, I continued to live on. But on her 45th birthday, Katie decided to celebrate it with her friends. Despite my desire to spend time together, she insisted on meeting with a friend who was leaving town. Reluctantly, I allowed her to leave and spent the evening alone, finding solace in the company of Mr. Jack Daniel. Katie is very active on Instagram and TikTok, sharing content daily that her friends enthusiastically support. Even her birthday celebration was streamed live on her account. But what I witnessed made me feel disgusted. Her friends surprised her with a cake, on top of which was depicted a male organ, artfully made to resemble a white cream that had just ejaculated. Her friends burst into cheers and danced with happiness. To my surprise, I discovered that she and her company had visited a men's strip club. When Katie finally returned, I plucked up the courage and decided to look into the situation. Having expressed my concern, I firmly stated that her action was inappropriate and devoid of decency. I did not fail to remind her that she has a 19-year-old son who witnessed everything that was happening. 
I also asked her how she spent her time at the strip club. She gave an explanation, saying that her friends had prepared a surprise for her. I expressed the opinion that the element of surprise disappeared when she reached the entrance to this place, since entering through this door was her decision. I expressed my dissatisfaction with her action, stressing that it did not correspond to the behavior expected of a married woman, especially considering that all her friends were unmarried. As a result, she burst into tears, and I decided to leave her alone. That night, I decided not to share our bedroom. The next morning, she didn't say anything and went to her gym without saying a word to me. When I arrived at the office, I noticed noticeable changes in the atmosphere, indicating that everything is not quite the same as before. I didn't know yet that the situation could get even worse. After two weeks, I plucked up the courage and asked her if she harbored any ill feelings towards me in connection with the incident that occurred at her birthday party. To my surprise, she stated that my reaction was caused by jealousy, because in her opinion, I lack friends and the ability to arrange such incredible parties in my life. I was stunned by her audacity. How could anyone be so stupid as to make such an unreasonable assumption? I refrain from going to strip clubs because of my obligations to my wife, and I dislike the very concept of participating in explicit entertainment. So I politely ended the conversation and went to my office. Although there was no significant improvement, we eventually resumed the conversation. Katie, on the other hand, became increasingly addicted to TikTok and attracted attention with her daily blogs. Over time, we continued to live our lives, and I made a conscious decision to stop watching her vlogs. I decided to celebrate my birthday with my son and Katie. But Katie seemed to be more passionate about her followers than actively involved in our time together. It is clear that my son was annoyed by her behavior and asked what was going on with her. I explained to him that she was too absorbed in the phenomenon of social media. Despite the disappointment, we managed to find humor in this situation and laugh at it. But when we were driving back, I decided to stop on the side of the highway, and Katie asked me to get out of the car. Although I was beside myself with rage, I made a conscious effort to control my emotions. After getting out of the car, she immediately began filming and posting the scenic view. Noticing this, I carefully picked up her phone, stopped the live broadcast, and kindly asked her to redirect her attention to our family. I stressed the importance of drawing a clear line and prioritizing quality time with loved ones. Otherwise, if she cannot commit to being present, I strongly asked her to respectfully apologize and not neglect our emotions and time. After standing in silence, she eventually returned to the car, demonstrating her reluctance to engage in conversation. It's been a year since her last birthday, and it's time to celebrate it again. When the clock struck midnight, I eagerly wished her a happy birthday and presented her with a beautiful gold bracelet decorated with diamonds. Overwhelmed with joy, she kissed me, expressing her gratitude. But my happiness quickly turned to anger when a few minutes later, she hurriedly packed up and left with her friends. Disappointment gripped me when I wondered if I still had any meaning in her life. When she finally returned, her state of intoxication left me with no hope of a full conversation or understanding. I approached her, expressed my concerns about our relationship, and suggested therapy as a way to solve our problems. But she hurriedly finished her juice and hurried to the gym, ignoring my request. Having decided to have this important conversation, I decided to skip work that day. Later, when she returned home with her friends, I plucked up the courage and asked her to join me in the bedroom for a conversation. The atmosphere was restless, but I understood that it was necessary to preserve our relationship. I asked her directly about her wishes and intentions, asking if she was interested in investing in our relationship. Katie sat down in a chair and frankly told me that for the last two years she had been thinking about divorce, feeling that she had reached the point in her life when she needed to start all over again. I hardly understood her words and asked for clarification. She spoke about her desire to start a new life, enlisting the support of friends. 
Anger seized me and I let out a scream. Your friends are people who manipulate rich men for financial gain, and there is no real self-realization in their lives. The only thing you observe is the surface gloss they show on the surface. Take a closer look at their existence. The smiles they show you hide loneliness and depression. If you want to go on a trip, go ahead. But always remember that the world beyond may not be as idyllic as it seems. There are people who prey on women like you, seek to take advantage of them, and do not hesitate to get rid of you. But I won't look to you for comfort in such circumstances. Perhaps you will only meet predatory creatures who will take advantage of your vulnerability. But I will find solace in any case. The atmosphere became motionless, making further dialogue and discussion unnecessary. The next day, Katie posted a video in which she said that she had been thinking about divorce for the last two years, and now, finally, she had achieved what she wanted. With the utmost honesty, she confessed, I'm at a loss what to do next. Exhausted and exhausted, I decided to divorce. I have tried to change a lot in my life, but fear does not leave me, both to a small and huge extent. She repeatedly contacted me, expressing a desire to talk. Reluctantly, I finally answered, but I heard her admit that she misses me. Taking advantage of the last opportunity, I plucked up the courage and asked if she would reconsider her decision. Legal documents will be filed tomorrow, and once that happens, there will be no turning back. After abruptly ending the conversation, we soon broke up, which led to a divorce. Katie quickly moved out of our house, leaving behind an unfinished relationship. While my son was trying to cope with the situation, he admitted that he had expected such an outcome. After our divorce was finalized, Katie took to social media and shared, I'm fine now. A week ago I couldn't imagine the slightest glimmer of hope, but over time, small signs of enlightenment appeared, like scattered toothpicks piercing a sheet of aluminum foil. Faint miniature rays of light made their way through them, not enough to show what was beyond the boundary, but enough to indicate the presence of light beyond the horizon. Even on the most difficult days, I fell asleep with the knowledge that I was approaching this insight. Looking back, I am proud to say that I did not succumb to stagnation. I went forward. I have abilities. I can achieve this. Best wishes if you persist in your endeavors. A few days later, she shared new information. I recommend conducting additional research into the reasons for the growing number of women realizing that they don't have to rely on men. They recognize that they no longer have to endure insults or infidelity, and they can even have a child without a male partner. However, this does not mean that they do not want to see a man in their lives, or that they perceive all men negatively. Let me introduce you to a new person in my life, an attractive man in his early 20s, with a well-developed physique and six-pack abs. I must say that my money was not spent in vain. Anticipating an unfavorable outcome, I went to my office. The next day I came across another video in which Katie tearfully talked about her recent breakup with her previous partner. This was not surprising, since I had a premonition that it would not last long, but the speed with which it ended was amazing. It seemed that the guy suddenly woke up one day and disappeared from her life. A mutual friend informed me that Katie was not the initiator of the breakup. In fact, she was the one who was dumped. Katie felt a deep sense of shame, which did not allow her to reveal something on the video. Shortly after this incident, she was seen in a restaurant accompanied by another young man. Coincidentally, I was present at the meeting and immediately left as soon as it ended, so Katie remained unaware of my presence. Seeing her with another person was kind of awkward, but this time it didn't hurt me or cause any emotions. Subsequently, my friend shared a video with me. In the video titled, 40 and Mischief, Katie confidently dances in her underwear and even boldly takes off her top. She could be seen being supported by her friends, which suggests that it was a private party at someone's house. Feeling awkward, I decided to block her. But a few days later on TikTok, I came across another video where Katie proudly shows off her bikini body by the pool and proclaims, 
This is what a 47-year-old woman looks like. Wow, this is very disappointing. Not only did she provide her Tinder ID, but when I clicked on the link, an image of an almost naked girl appeared in front of me, only partially covered with clothes. It looks like Katie posted another video, this time with another young man. It was obvious that he was not happy about being filmed, as he hurriedly pulled on a hoodie as soon as he realized that he was being filmed. It became obvious that he was only interested in entertainment without any obligations. Once his goal was achieved, he quickly disappeared. A few days later, Katie posted another video in which she expressed her thoughts. I have come to a decision, but do I feel remorse? I'm not sure. Did I create a chaotic situation? I'm not sure. Maybe it wasn't as terrible as I thought at the beginning, but thinking about it today, I realize that my marriage was not just mediocre, but quite satisfactory. I deeply regret that I destroyed the love that my husband had for me. I am in a state of emotional turmoil, knowing full well that Ted warned me. Unfortunately, I decided not to listen to his advice. All I crave is to get back to my old life, where my husband was by my side and my friends supported me. I just long to be reunited with my family. It pains me to admit that I was really warned, but I didn't listen. And now that Chad and Tyrone have completed their fleeting romance known as the pump and dump session, is she considering returning? By no means. Leftovers are not my thing. I was at my workplace when Katie suddenly appeared. Being interested in her sudden appearance, I asked her about her intentions, and she expressed a desire to return home. I couldn't help but chuckle at the mention of the word home. The house is no longer there because I sold our old house and financed your new apartment, Nirvana as you call it. Therefore the concept of home no longer exists. She asked about the possibility of moving in with me. I explained that my devoted giant Bernard shares a bed with me and is wary of strangers. She insisted that she was not different. But Katie, in the eyes of my dog, you really are a stranger, and I can't accept you into my life. I'm not Will Smith, and you're not Jada Pinkett Smith. If my wife chooses someone other than me, our relationship will end. I'm out of her reach. I refuse to wallow in self-pity. Instead, I accept the situation and move forward. After Katie left in tears, I returned home to the comforting presence of my faithful dog. Later, I came across a letter from Katie in which she expressed deep disappointment with the reality she faced and the problems associated with finding love at her age. It's true, Katie, you've been warned about these obstacles. Starting a new relationship at 47 is not an easy task. When the fruit reaches its ripeness, it is intended for consumption. But if you don't eat it for too long, it spoils and decomposes. Nature teaches us valuable lessons but we often neglect them. Despite the fact that you had everything you could wish for, you were striving for something forbidden for a married woman. As a result, you made the decision to leave, which led to your expulsion. Given my 50 years of age, I see no point in looking for love again, and therefore, perhaps, I will not decide to marry again. The affection my dog gives me is quite enough. As soon as my son is ready to take a place in my office, I will transfer my assets to him. I'm looking forward to spending time outdoors, basking in the sun among the beauty of nature. Katie continues to search for love, but meets only intimacy for one night. This stupid woman hoped that she would meet a young prince and find happiness. But what kind of young man needs a 47-year-old woman?